you know, all about the, the witch and uh, the witch up in the house and the cow and the calf and all of that. So it was absolutely brilliant today. And I'm always amazed by the amount of, you know, when we'd have tourists coming in. We're in lockdown now with COVID at the moment, but um, when tourists will be coming in and the, the amount of knowledge that they have about our area and we have locals and probably myself that wouldn't have known as much you know I kind of live nearly every day down the wood walking around and looking up at the hills but I didn't really know what I should know. In Portugal and in northern Spain in Galicia, Cantabria, Asturias and so Galicia so on you've got um, a version of the rainbow and the rainbow is Arco de la Vieja and who's the Vieja? Yeah, we met her before. She's busy over there as well. And all of the characteristics, or almost all of the characteristics that we have of our Kalyuk that we keep, that, that lives here and that um, isn't too far away from me here behind me, um, you have in the Spanish one as well, or in the, in the, in, in the Cantabrian. So how old is that story? How far back along our steps? It only, the earliest you can trace it in Irish texts is the 10th century. But who knows how, how old it goes beyond that. And the characteristics that you talk that we talk about and that we have and associate with this Kalyuk um, are great age, for a start. She lives longer than lakes and rivers. Um, another characteristic is an association with winter and seasonality and the changing of the seasons. Um, she's associated to she's the spare man, so she she flies. And she makes great steps, as we said, across the landscape. And effectively, effectively, in these landscapes where she is active, she's the set dresser. She creates the, 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 ba the background scenes over which the Gaelic texts play out and the whole steps that we've talked about play out. She's dropping stones from great heights. She's making cairns. She's making natural erratics. She's, she's, she's busy. She's both a, a positive influence and she's a destructive influence as well. She has two sides to her persona. Um, she's very much associated with the wild. She eats seaweed. She eats wild garlic. She eats salmon. She's very much associated with the wild and in a way perhaps you could see her as a metaphor for wild nature and that that's the folkloric take on the Kalyak Vera. The Bera being to do with the word sharp, Bera, sharpness. She's a sharp hag. But also the, the, the bear also associates with some of her other names, like Bui and Oinya. So if you go up to Kulani, Kul Oinya is the place where she hangs out under a different uh, name. So th th that's her. But she also has another uh, life as well, and that's in the legalistic texts. of Some of them are reasonably late, but there'll be 14th, 15th century texts that describe the process of Gaelic kingship. And say, for example, in the 13th century up at Cairn Free, the king marries the earth and there's an intercessionary figure there who is 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 a sovereignty goddess so that's the Kalyak in that way becomes a sovereignty goddess in other words representing wild nature the king is wedded to the Kalyak and so that um, in sort of legalistic terms it means that there's there's all this 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 sort of um the the, the, the puella senelis is this idea of this woman that embodies or this figure this entity that in, embodies both old age and decrepitude and promise and spring so my another aspect of the passage tombs in ireland uh, compared to the west of the rest of europe but also to all other megalithic tombs in Ireland as such, is that they tend to, in these large clusters, that like Curira is one, the Bruna Bonia is another one, Loch Crewe is the third one, and Carrochiel is the fourth one, we'll see in a few moments. They tend to divide the kind of ritual landscapes in three. We know that well from the Boyne Valley, where you have Newgrange, Nauth and Douth, the three huge mounds uh, with smaller uh, uh, tombs around them, or smaller sites around them. We also have, seem to have that kind of three partitioning in Loch Crewe. And we definitely have it in Colera. It's like a textbook when it comes to that tri tri tree partitioning of the landscape. If you can imagine the map, which might be hard, but in the e western end we have Nocturne as one group. In the middle we have Caramore as one group. And then to the east of that, we have Carnes Hill, the two large mounds, literally behind us, as I pointed out. And that really strictly uh, parts or, or divides the Kulira Peninsula in three segments. 
And they all have different stories to tell when it comes to monuments and the way that the monuments have been placed on these three locations. I think that has a paramount importance. And we, to be honest, we just don't know why we have that tree partitioning, but it seems to be reflected in a number of ways. Uh, another aspect of it is, for example, that the classical, typical chamber shape in the Irish passage tombs is a chamber formed as a crucifix, it's a cruciform chamber. So you have a right-hand part, you have a left-hand part, and you have a center part. So you have three different sections, even in the burial chamber where the bones are found. And that is, to some degree, then reflected in the way that the landscape has been used. And that also hides a very complex narrative uh, that we are not, we're just starting to unravel that, and we don't really know why. And of course, as I always say to my students, well, that's the beauty of prehistoric archaeology. We'll never get any answers. We could just assume and make predictions and, 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 and interpretations. We never know how it actually was. But that's a fact that we have that strong divide of the landscape. And so from a, from a larger perspective, that makes also the Carrera very strictly unique because it has been used, the landscape, both horizontally in three different ways, but also topographically, as I will speak about in a few moments at the next site. The reason why I'm stopping here is really to point out that this site could be down at Caramore. It's a copy of the sites three kilometers behind me. And it consists of a simple boulder circle, a circle of boulders that have been destroyed where you are because there was a path or, or, or a dirt track going up. So that part of the circle is gone. But we have a circle of boulders and they are kind of originally probably put set shoulder to shoulder while they are missing in that part. And in the center, we do have a chamber. So a chamber, fairly extensive, consisting of four slabs, and there might have been a roof slab over that. So very much comparable to the site that we have down at Caramore. What is interesting is that this site is sitting at the very end of this long um, ridge. At the very end, so at the, at the edge of the ridge, where you suddenly get a vista down towards Caramore. So it's kind of looking down, talking to its pals down below at Caramore, but still being halfway up the mountain. So this is the only site on the entire ridge. And this ridge is nearly 1.2 kilometer. So it's the only site, sits at the very end of it, making kind of a, kind of communicating down to Caramore. And then at the, at the higher part of the mountain, which is the one that you do see in postcards and any kind of way passing by, that's up there is where we have the larger sites and a few others. But this sits on its own. But it creates a kind of a bridge between Karamori in the lowland and the sites up, uh, up on the summit. So that's the reason why I think this is very, very important. And, and uh, never been excavated. We don't know what's in it. It probably has been uh, messed around with and maybe excavated well before any record exists. So we don't know, but no finds from this site. Uh, but it's definitely a passage tomb. And when we come up to this place here, this is a stone row. It's listed on the National Monuments list, but it's, um, this is an Irish uh, Gadi, the thief, the boy, and the cow. And let me just introduce you to the main players here. This is the boy here. He's a small little fella. This lad here is about, what is he, 1.7 meters tall. That's the thief himself. And you, you know, for years and years you come here and you see people leaving little personal things. I never saw anybody do it, but you find little coins and toys and bits and pieces. Now the cow is a bit harder to see. You have to crane your next to see her. She's over here. The cow, that's the cow there. Somebody tipped the cow. Yeah, I mean, the, from an archeological point of view, this is listed as a stone row. And this, the, the, the theory on this is that that was 1.6 meters tall. So the, it would have stood in line with the boy and he was about there to about that height. So I suppose that tells you something about the, 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 the longevity of the story or the, the degree to which we've done some reinvention uh, since the thing fell over. Before we leave this, I just have to say something about passage tomb as well. I, t I say use the term passage tomb all the time. Passage tomb, passage tomb. Passage tombs indicate that there's a tomb, a chamber, and it's reached by a passage. But as you can see, there's no passage. In mo many of these sites, you actually don't really have a passage. 
but in the larger sites you would have a very pronounced and very well-built passage. But the passage tomb tradition, uh, the, the finds that we do find in these sites, are more or less identical in all the sites. And that's what kind of bind, binds them together into a ritual tradition. Then the actual site might differ a bit in construction, but they are all within the Irish passage tomb tradition. And uh, with the peak of that would be New Grange and now, of course, with extremely elaborate sites. And this is kind of at the, I wouldn't say lower end, but the earlier end and slightly more simple. But still, the finds that we would find if we excavate this would not be too far from the finds that we do find in sites like Newgrange. Cremated bones, some bits of pottery, some bits of quartz, maybe some stone balls, maybe some bone pins, and not very elaborate finds. And these are the kind of finds that we find in most of these, of these uh, passage tombs. It turns out that locally around here you have the story of how these arrive here with respect to this boy who used to milk the cow for the Caliph Vera and he'd go up every day and do his work and then return home and praise the cow to his father. She was a magic cow, the best cow in Ireland with more milk and better milk than any other cow before. The father got sick of the story eventually and told the boy, listen, don't tell me that story anymore. You know, rep repetition isn't good. And we don't even have a cow ourselves. We have no milk. So he thought of a great idea. Why don't we steal that cow from the Cali Caveira? Great, well, good idea, brilliant, brilliant. So uh, one night when it was very dark, the two of them headed up the mountain. Isn't that right, Mary? And uh, they went up to the Cali Caveira, up to the, where the witch lives. We're going to, that's the last stop on our walk. And the boy knew where the cow was because he was well used to milking her. So he went in and they conducted their, their subterfuge there. They went in and set the cow free and everything was going perfectly to plan. They started heading off down the mountain. You know, easy peasy, until they didn't dance step on a dry stick and back went a big loud noise and didn't the witch wake up. Ah, oh, the hag, the kayak, whatever one have her, the goddess, she woke up. She wasn't very too happy at all. She was being awoken from sleep, wasn't, didn't, didn't work very well for her and she pointed her finger or distaff or whichever version of the story you're telling yourself and she froze in stone forever. The thief, the boy and the cow level. Clohagadi, the stone of the thief. So that's the story, the framework around how in cumulatively we have a lake up here we're not going to visit it today but further on beyond where we are is a place where she would swim in the folklore. Um, the, the, so the mountain is associated with her presence. W, William Butler Yeats talked to people in Balasadere and over in Ballygawley and Ballantoher about this. And basically this, this little set of four hills, where there's four hills, if we, we stand over and knock Nore when we go on Stefan's walk, we'll, turn, we'll look back and we'll see these four little gently rounded hills, each one with a little bump on top, kind of adding to their femininity. And the bump, bumps are the ancient monuments placed on the summits of the hills. And that's where we're headed. We're going to make a couple of stops before we get to there. We'll talk about a few other topics as we go on up. But for now, let's go to the next stop. The broader picture is that, yes, these tends to be earlier. So, but also they, of course, they make a, a lower impact visually. This is not really meant to be seen from a distance. Queen May's grave is literally meant to be seen. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's the only purpose, but it's one of the major purposes with the cairn. To make a statement, to make a visual statement, but also to create a presence in the landscape. And I will talk about that up on the summit, because it's a very kind of interesting contrast between the large cairn of Queen Maeve and the smaller sites up on the summit, which do exist, they are literally on the summit, but you can't see them from below. But the cairn you can see, of course. So yes, there are different functions, and also I think that there's a slight difference in chronology. So I wouldn't say more advanced, but it's, as the hierarchy escalates over time, uh, the, the, um, the complexity and also the work that you put into, or that you manage to gather uh, to put into a site like that, increases over time. And this is, that feeds into what Porrick spoke about this morning, which I think is really interesting with the DNA and, and the link that we are. I mean, we kind of knew it, 
but we know now that we are looking at a kind of, the word dynasty has been used, but I mean, we're looking at a hierarchy, higher level of society that had a great mobility within Ireland. And you've probably seen increased mobility uh, in the country towards the later part of the passage to tradition. So the guys up here would, of course, as we know now, would know the guys in, in, in Newgrange and, and the Boyne Valley. So that kind of social uh, hierarchy also, of course, means that you have power to build large sites like this. So there's a, also a level of kind of status statements. You know, you, you do have um, you do have eagle on the gateposts today, you know, and you have very big houses and you have smaller houses, you know. Depends on the statement you would like to know, to make. It's absolutely impressive the, the wealth of heritage that Sligo, County Sligo, but more particularly this area and this peninsula uh, possesses, which takes us back to our very earliest Irish ancestors. And this is really something that is even up, like in Kearns Hill, the large cairn on Kearns Hill sits also on the limestone mountain. And you do have a large cairn, but the curb around that cairn is not, not limestone at all. It's always uh, nice or granite or anything. That it, yeah, so we, which means that they're really making a point of that. And the number of, if we have 30, 40, 50 sites at Kerrmore, none, none of them have limestone. They all gathered uh, boulders, erratics, uh, in that circle. So that is really a kind of a hallmark, in a way, of the passage stone tradition in Sligo, that you do have that particular type of stone. You might find the odd limestone in the chamber, uh, but never in the circle. That I've learned more about the history of our people. They're dead and gone, I suppose. And, uh, more about uh, Knocknare that I f walk frequently or climb, and that, and other bits and pieces like the uh, the stones, the arrangement of stones. And, and of course, it was available. This was available all over the place, like erratics. Uh, but I was chatting to someone walking down uh, this morning that in down in Kilmacoon, the plenty of erratics in Kilmacoon, just a few kilometres away from from Carrmore. But if you look around Carrmore, there are very few erratics because they were all nicked in the Neolithic <laughs> to build the sites. So they had the, the, the building material locally. Uh, but it's a very good point. I think it's really, it's really interesting. We can see the few curb stones that none are visible now, but the few curb stones that are visible at Queen Maeve's grave are also, even sitting on the limestone hill, are also uh, nice, the rock nice. So, even though they have abundance of limestone, they wouldn't go for that. I got out um, fascinating information about where I live. Um, and I got out into nature for the whole day, which was great with people who really know about the land and can teach you when you're, um, do you know, when you have all that extra information about where you are, suddenly everything is so much, um, deeper and more interesting. So, back to the car park, I'm sorry to say, uh, but then it's only uphill from there, so.